The Boba Fett adventures continue here on the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel with The Mandalorian Armor Audiobook Part 6. If this is your first time listening, you can go and find Parts 1 to 5 in the description below so you can start from the beginning. And before I move on to Chapter 14, our next chapter, I will just call out some folks in the comments like I like to do. The first is our wonderful regular Matt Curtis, who uh, said on Chapter 10, where... The Emperor and Prince Zizor and Vader were having a long conversation. Max said, I know Vader was secretly giggling behind his mask as the Emperor said, Sometimes I think that you would prefer if that I only trusted you. Yes, Vader is particularly protective in that whole scene. I do think he comes across a little bit like an overprotective, overjealous boyfriend. Seems like he's a bit worried that Zizor is going to become the Emperor's favourite and it won't be him anymore. Uh, we also have Mike in the comments who has said, Love your stuff. Keep up the great job. Thank you so much, Mike. It really means so much to me to have your encouragement. We will keep it up. Um, really loving doing these audiobooks and we'll be putting them out. On that note, we also had uh, Ultimate Solder. Um, thanks very much for commenting, Ultimate. It genuinely does help us. Um, and Ultimate has said, uh, This is so amateur. Wow. Yeah, that's true. This is very amateur. Uh, Gilbs has already responded, but I will just say, Look, guys that's what this is there is an official audiobook please always go and support the original creators we're here as fans and people that love it making a fan built project that we can all enjoy so i am afraid the quality isn't as high end as the official audiobook is but it is unabridged so i hope you'll stay and enjoy and hang out in the comments with us and I also have to give thanks to Matches Malone, who also responded to Ultimate Soldier, saying, is that a crime? Also, it was quite nice and said, his voice sounds pretty polished and quality is good. Thanks so much, Matches. Again, really glad to have you here. I hope you're here for the rest of the book. And now, I will continue with the rest of the book and start reading Chapter 14. Now, this is back in the past, so Boba Fett is at the Bounty Hunters Guild, and he's currently speaking with Bosk. 14, then. There's something big coming down. Bost's smile was jagged and ugly as always. Something really big. Boba Fett leaned back against the wall behind the stone bench. Nothing the Trandoshan told him ever came as a surprise. The big reptile just hadn't learned that yet, about how far behind the curve he was always fated to be. Maybe he will find out, thought Fett. Before he dies. Go on, said Fett. In the meantime, there was some value to a pretense of ignorance on his own part. Tell me about it. Wait a second. Bosk turned his scaly head, looking over the bleak contents of Boba Fett's temporary quarters at the Bounty Hunters Guild's main complex. He had already pushed the iron hinge door shut behind himself with a push from his clawed hand. This isn't, he growled in a low voice, something everybody needs to know about. The inspection from his slit-pupiled eyes apparently satisfied him that there were no obvious listening devices installed in the cracks between the damp stones. At least they don't need to for the moment. You have a compulsion for secrecy, Boba Fett said. Idiot he thought. A thousand snooping machines could have been hidden in the chamber that a mere visual scan wouldn't have detected. Well, that's commendable. Gotta be careful. Bosk sat down on the bench beside him and leaned in close. Especially about something like this. Which is? All around the sparsely furnished, rough-hewn space, the corridors of the Bounty Hunters Guild compound folded and coiled around each other, replicating the devious pathways of the mines contained therein. Those mines, of the Bounty Hunters themselves, had been getting progressively more devious since Boba Fett's arrival in their midst. He could sense it, like being inside an infinitely replicating maze, branching through fractal progressions of paranoia and deceit. That was fine by him. It was what his plans, and those of the arachnoid assembler Kudama Bat, called for. The bounty hunters were already getting lost in that maze. Some of them wouldn't survive to find their way out. It's different for me, thought Fett. 
he was unconcerned about the maze's exponential complexity. It didn't matter whether he had a map or a thread leading his way out. When the time came, he would break his way through the encircling walls as though they were made of flimsy plast rather than the stone of other sentient creatures' greed and malice. Soon enough. A big job, said Bosk, his claws tightened reflexively as though upon either the neck of some merchandise or the credits to be gotten for it. The kind you like. Fett kept any trace of emotion out of his voice. Words blank as the visor of his helmet. They're big. Leaning in even closer, Bosk whispered hoarsely into the audio receptor at the side of Fett's helmet. The Trandoshan fang line smile was even bigger when he drew away, the number recited. I see. Boba Fett wasn't surprised by the amount of money being offered. He had his own sources of information, so much sharper and beyond those of any guild member. That's an enticing sum. He wasn't surprised either that Bosk had shaved a quarter million credits off the price. Like most bounty hunters, Bosk had a flexible notion of what constituted a fair division of profits. Very enticing indeed. Yeah, ain't it? The contemplation of that kind of credits flow seemed to inspire a new level of glittering-eyed avarice in Bosk. I knew you'd go for it. Then what is the exact nature of this merchandise? Boba Fett already knew, but he had to ask in order to keep up the masquerade. Bosk had to believe that he was revealing the details rather than just confirming them. Somebody must want it pretty badly to put that kind of price on it. You can say that again. Bosk held up one claw. Here's the scoop. Seems a certain Lyonisi com handler named Ofna Dinid managed to work himself up a real case of hyper eros. The toothy smile shifted into a leer. You know how it goes. The same old story. Fett knew what the Trandoshan was talking about. The Lyonisi were one of six sentient species on Ryun a planet down-spiral from one of the remoter sectors of the Outer Rim territories. Unusually dismal conditions had been brought about millennia ago by a seemingly permanent suspension of volcanic ash in the upper atmosphere, resulting in a ruthless competition for survival. The other inhabitants of Ryun would have wiped out the Lionessi long ago if the fragile creatures hadn't mastered the arts of interspecies communication. Their skills went far beyond mere translation of words and meaning. Surrounded by enemies, with a continuation of their own breed dependent upon every nuance of language and gesture, the Lionessi brought their lives with interpretive skills far beyond even the most highly developed protocol droid. On Ryun, that meant they made possible all the fluid and rapidly shifting diplomacy between the planet's other species the madly dissolving and reforming alliances, the declarations of war and swiftly terminated peace treaties between sentient creatures who didn't even share the same metabolic basis, let alone language. In the galaxy beyond Ryun, the Lionessi were found at every communication nexus, sorting out and fine-tuning the messages and negotiations between one wildly dissimilar sector of the Empire and another. All that expertise at reading other species' intentions and secrets had its downside, though. From time to time, the various Lionessi fell prey to their own sensitivity. An all-consuming passion seized them. Worse, it was nearly always reciprocated by the object of the desire. Unlike members of the reptilian Farleen species, whose conquests were achieved with a notable coldness and lack of feeling, Lionessi and their hyper-erotic targets rapidly found themselves in situations where neither partner was left with a shred of self-preserving intelligence. Given the high-level diplomatic stations where Lionessi were so often found, the results were usually catastrophic and fatal. I know the story, said Boba Fett, both in general and in the specific case of Off-Nar-Dinid. 
which his own sources had told him about. Better that a high-ranking female should get involved with someone like Prince Zizor. The experience is reputedly more intense and pleasurable, and after it's over, the female might still be alive if she keeps her wits about her. Fett supposed that with someone like his sometime employer Zizor, that was what passed as chivalry. The problem with Lionessi is that they're not smart enough to be heartless. Yeah, well, this Dinid person managed to get himself into a large capacity vat of nerf waste. Bosk sneered. He had been born without those wasteful, sentimental emotions. He was working for one of the major liegeholder clans out in the Narod system. I won't say which one. You don't have to. They're all alike. Boba Fett was well acquainted with those clans. They were really more loose confederations of genetically linked species, with deep layers of ritual obeisance and internal blood oaths patching over their differences. It didn't work. They needed the ultra-diplomatic Lionessi around just to keep from killing each other off. A good gig for the natives of a backwater world like Ryun, as long as they didn't screw up. But they always did. Let me guess, said Boba Fett. Dinid's employers found him in a, let's say, compromising position, with a wife or daughter from one of the top clan houses. Got that one right. Bosk's eyes glittered as sharp as his fangs. A Trandoshan's enjoyment of another creature's troubles went far beyond the mere anticipation of profit to be gained thereby. All the way to the top, right up to the Supreme Liege Lord himself. And just like these Lionessi, they've got no sense at all. The revelation of the affair was in public at one of the formal clan oath ceremonies. Couple thousand sub-lieges and their retinues, all in their lord's great hall. Somebody accidentally struck the curtain behind the dais. It collapses, and there's our off Nardinid and the liege lord is Alpha Concubine. All for the galaxy to see. Like I said, no sense at all. Bosk's description of events matched what Fett's sources had told him. It's remarkable that this Dinid person got out alive. I take it back. The guy had some sense. Bosk shrugged. Not enough to keep himself out of trouble, but at least enough to have already planned his escape route when the nerf droppings hit the ventilation system. There was a lot of confusion in the Great Hall, you can imagine. And Dinid hightailed it out to a speeder he kept fueled and waiting, with its destination coordinates already programmed in. Where could he go? Where would be safe, that is? Boba Fett already knew the answer, but continued with his pretense. The Narrant leads lords of a sense of honour that doesn't easily accept embarrassment. They'll stop at nothing to get someone who has publicly humiliated them back in their grasp. True, Bosk gave a quick nod. That's why this particular lord has put up such a killer bounty for the merchandise he wants. He can't just take his own troops out and hunt down the little idiot, haul him back and get whatever satisfaction he can out of Dinid's hide. At least, not without spreading the story even farther afield. So, naturally, the Lord wants the bounty hunters to do his dirty work for him. Silence was always a desired commodity in the bounty hunter trade. Boba Fett had made a speciality of quick, efficient, and quiet work. With that kind of credits being put up, I expect every bounty hunter in the guild will be going after Ofnardinid. It's not that easy, said Bosk. The sneak not only had his escape means planned, he had the perfect place to hold up figured out as well. He's with the Shell Huts. Boba Fett had heard that much as well. Of all the Hutties' clans, the Shell Huts were the least numerous 
and the most removed from the various alliances and interconnected dealings that bonded the other huts together, except in bulk and physiognomy. They had the same basic body mass and large-eyed, slit-mouth faces, perfect for greedily stuffing assorted wriggling tidbits into. In that sense of wanting to control everything on which their immense eyes fastened, they were identical to the rest of the huts. Identical in anatomic toughness as well, with thick, leathery skins impervious to blaster shots and acids, and vital organs so deeply buried under layers of blubber that they couldn't even be nicked with a vibroblade. The only physical threat that huts feared was specific bands of hard, unshielded radiation, the kind whose toxic effects built up in their bodies shielding fat rather than being dissipated through normal excretion processes. That had kept the huts from extending their criminal enterprises to certain areas of the galaxy, until one of the Hutties' clans sometime in the hazy millennia of the past had given themselves what their own genetics had failed to. Protective armor casings, bolted and welded together from heavy durasteel plates, supported and maneuvered about by built-in repulsor fields. All that showed off the shelled hut's soft, gelatinous flesh were their jowly faces, protruding tortoise-like from the iris-collared ports at the front of the floating ovoid cases. Even the shell hut's delicate little hands were hidden inside, manipulating the controls for the externally mounted grasping devices. Those seemed to work just as well at grabbing onto and holding big chunks of ill-gotten wealth. Why would the shell huts be interested in a comm handler on the run? Boba Fett had dealings with vicious members of the shell huts. He knew that they didn't do anything without a credits-related reason, just like the other Hutties. If they need that level of translation and diplomacy skills, they can just buy whoever's on the market. Someone who doesn't have a price on his head. Off Nadinid made himself valuable to them. A trace of grudging admiration sounded in Bosk's harsh voice. Seems he had memory augmenters surgically implanted in his cortical areas and stuffed them full of the narrowed system's top-secret business information, dealings and records that he had access to from working as the Supreme Liege Lord's protocol intermediary. There's a lot of data inside Denid's head that the shell huts have found to be pretty interesting and profitable. So, that's not something that would keep the needs safe for long. The shell huts aren't exactly reticent about stripping data out of somebody's memory and then tossing the remains out like an empty husk. Bosk leaned closer. Close enough that Boba Fett could smell blood and meat through his helmet's air filters. Dinid may not be an idiot, all right. But he's not that kind of idiot. The memory augmenters he had inside his skull have a time-based readout function wired into them. All the secret business data from the narrowed system that he's carrying around is released a few bits at a time. Plus, it's under an auto-destruct encryption. The shell huts try to crack his head open to get at the data. Everything gets swiped. But that's not even the best part. They can't even tell how much data is inside Dinid. Basically, he's valuable to the shell huts for an indefinite period of time. It could be decades before the information is done spooling out of him. That was clever of him. As with the rest of the story that Bosk had just related, Boba Fett feigned hearing it for the first time. But it also seems that the shell huts aren't going to let go of him for a good long time. Damn straight, agreed Bosk. He tapped a single claw against Boba Fett's chest. It's not going to be easy prying him out of their hands. That's why the bounty hunters aren't going out one by one to try and pull off this job. 
It's going to take a team to nail down this piece of merchandise. Fett had been expecting this as well. Are you making me an offer? Maybe. Bosk pulled back, taking another scan around the chamber and toward the rough-hewn door. Let's face it. Things have been pretty tense around here since you showed up. The Trandoshan's slitted eyes bored fiercely into the dark visor of Fett's helmet. There's a lot of talk going on from the old guard like my father and the rest of the Guild Council. All the way down to the rawest bounty hunter on the membership list. What kind of talk? Don't mess with me, growled Bosk. You're valuable to me right now, but if you start getting funny, I'll eat your brains out of your helmet like a soup bowl. If I'm making you an offer, then it isn't just about catching hold of this off na need guy. Though, that should be reason enough for you to be interested. But it's about the future of the whole Bounty Hunters Guild. There's going to be some big changes coming down here, and people are lining up on one side or another, depending on which way they think it's going to go. Frankly, I'd rather have you on my side than not. But whatever side you're on, I'm still going to win. It'll be easier with you than without. And it'll be easier if you and I and a couple of other hand-picked barbs pull off this Dinid job. The bounty we'll get from it will buy us a lot of friends. But more than that, It'll show some of the fence sitters around here just who's got what it takes to snag the hard merchandise. The ones who can do this job are the ones who should be running the guild. You've thought a great deal about this. Boba Fett kept his own voice level and free of emotion. Again, I'm impressed. Cut the flattery. The point of Bosk's claw dug a little deeper into Fett's chest. All I want to know is, are you with me on this one? Bosk's eyes widened in surprise as Boba Fett's hand suddenly grabbed the other's fist, squeezing the bones hard enough to grate them together between the overlapping scales. Fett's slowly and deliberately moved Bosk's captured hand away from himself, like setting a peculiar and unlovely art object at a distance. All right. Fed released his Durasteel hard grip. I'm with you. Sulkily, Bosk rubbed the joints of his hand. Good, he said after a moment. I'll talk to some of the others. The ones who'll make the kind of team we need. He stood up from the stone bench. I'll let you know how it's going. Boba Fett watched the Trandoshan pull the chamber's door shut behind himself, then listened to the sound of his footsteps fading down the corridor outside. It's almost said, thought Fett. The poor Barve didn't know just how well things were already going. But he'd find out soon enough. Your son has just concluded his visit. The Major Domo for the Bounty Hunters Guild headquarters bowed his head, an obsequious grin on his face. And his conversation with the unsavory individual known as Boba Fett proceeded just as you, in your ever-present wisdom, predicted it would. Kradosk regarded the bobbing figure of the Twi'lek, all crouching curtsies and avarice brightened eyes. The glistening, bifurcate head-tails of his underling reminded him of both Norellian ground slugs and uncooked sausages. That notion sparked an automatic twinge of hunger in his gut. But then, most things had that effect upon him. Of course it did! In his own luxuriously appointed quarters, Kradosk fidgeted with the heavy straps of his normal business garb. The fabrics, a minor-keyed visual symphony in sombre yet tasteful greys and blacks. 
The gaudier robes he'd worn at the banquet welcoming Boba Fett to the guild had been hung by the major domo in a vacuum-maintained, humidity-controlled closet. Things go as I predict them, not because of any wisdom I might possess, but because of a tiresome lack of wisdom on other creatures' parts. Your worshipfulness is entirely too modest. Ob Fortuna worked his way around Krardosk, pale and clammy hands darting out to make some final adjustments to his employer's everyday outfit. Would I have foreseen such things, or your illustrious colleagues on the council? Not very likely. That's because you and they are fools alike. The thought depressed Krardosk. All the burdens of leadership weighed upon his shoulders. There was no one to help him guide the bounty hunter's guild through these perilous shoals, in which conspiratorial enemies thronged like pack sharks. Not even his own son. Spawn of my seed, Krardosk mused gloomily. It just showed that true rapacious savvy was derived more from experience than genetics. I shouldn't have been so easy on him when he was just a little reptile. Someone else is here to see you. The Major Domo made a few more final adjustments to Krardosk's garb. Did you call for him? Should I grant him admittance? Yes, to both questions. The fawning Twi'lek was getting on his nerves. And it's a private matter, so your presence is not required. The Major Domo ushered in the bounty hunter Zuckus, then disappeared on the other side of the door he closed behind himself. Of all the younger, rawer bounty hunters who'd gained admittance to the guild, Zuckus had always seemed one of the least suited for the trade. Krardosk gazed at the breathing masked figure in front of him and wondered why any rational creature would place himself at such risk. It was like a child playing a dangerous adult game, where the wages were one's own life and the forfeits were measured out in pain and death. His original motivation for pushing Zuckus, with that less than imposing stature and dangling tubes of breathing assistance apparatus onto Bosk, had been to give his son an easily disposable partner. Someone who could be sacrificed in a tight situation with little regret or loss to the organization. There were more where Zuckers came from, would-be bounty hunters with inflated notions about their own skills and toughness were always lining up at the guild's doors. This particular situation had changed though. Krardosk had another use for young Zuckers. I came as quickly as I could. Zuckus was visibly nervous and audibly. The breath tubes curving at the bottom of his face mask fluttered. I hope it isn't anything that... Calm yourself. Krardosk lowered himself into a folding campaign chair made of femurs reinforced with jurasteel rods. If you were in any kind of trouble, believe me... You'd know about it already. Zuckers didn't appear reassured. He glanced over his shoulder, as though the door of the chamber had been a trap mechanism snapping shut. Actually, there's nothing wrong at all. The bones of the chair were worn smooth beneath Krardosk's palms. Much of what you've done has met with my approval. Really? Zuckus turned his gaze back toward the guild leader. Of course, lied Krardosk. I have reports concerning you. My son, Bosk, is not easily impressed. That is, with anyone other than himself. But he spoke quite highly of you. The business with that accountant. What was his name? That was a possendum. Zuckus gave a quick nod. Nil Possendum. It's really a shame that didn't go better. We nearly had him. Clawed hands spread wide. Krardosk's shrug was both elaborate and soothing. One does the best one can. 
Not everything happens the way it should. To say something like that required genuine acting ability on his part. Bad luck can happen to anyone. Inside himself, Krodosk still felt like pulling off both his son's and Zuckus's head for screwing up that job so badly. Boba Fett had made complete fools out of both of them, and then repeated the ignominy when he'd slipped past them to come sailing into the Bounty Hunters Guild headquarters. Don't worry about it. There'll be other times, other chances. There's always another piece of merchandise. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. You have to take the long view in this business. He had given the exact same lecture to Bosk, and had been sneered at years ago. You win some, you lose some. The trick is to win more than you lose. Go for the averages. Well, that's true, I guess. Zuckus's anxiety level now seemed genuinely lowered. Except for Boba Fett. He always seems to win. Even Boba Fett. One of Krados's hands made a grand, all-encompassing gesture. You wouldn't know it just by his reputation, but he and I go back a long way, and I can tell you that he's had his share of times when he's come up empty. Don't let that general aura of invincibility fool you. Well, it's hard not to be impressed, the things that are said about him. Krados leaned forward in the campaign chair and jabbed a claw into Zuckus's chest. I've been in the bounty hunter trade a long time, boy, and I'm telling you now, you're every bit as tough a barb as the great Boba Fett. I am? Sure you are. In a Gamorian's eye, thought Krados to himself. He continued with the pitch. I can tell there are certain, shall we say, ineffable characteristics of the born bounty hunter. Someone with the appetite and the skills for succeeding in this trade. I can smell them. That's why I'm the head of the Bounty Hunters Guild, just because my being is such a keen judge of character. He tapped the side of his snout with one claw. And my instincts tell me that those are exactly the skills you have. Well, Zuckus surely look his head in amazement. I'm flattered. It's too easy, thought Krodosk, telling creatures what they wanted to hear, down in however many hearts they carried around inside themselves, was the quickest and surest way to get them ready for sticking the knife in. The defences went down like so many security shields with surge-blown power fuses. Don't be! He had this Zuckus exactly where he wanted him. Time to spring the rest of the trap. The truth in this matter is important to both of us. Because there's something I need you to do for me. Something important. Anything! Zucker said quickly. He spread his gloved hands apart. I'd be honored. That's fine. With his own upraised hand, Krados cut off the young bounty hunter. I understand. Loyalty is another one of those characteristics so important in our trade that I discern in you. He tilted his head to one side, displaying an uneven, insinuating smile. But we have to choose our loyalties, don't we? I'm not sure I know what you mean. You've worked with my son Bosk on a couple of jobs. So, you're loyal to him, aren't you? There was no hesitation before Zucker spoke. Oh, of course, absolutely. Well, get over it. The partial smile disappeared as Krados slouched back in the campaign chair. Your loyalty is to me, 
and that's for a very simple reason. There's some rough times coming around here. As a matter of fact, they've already started. Some creatures aren't going to come out the other end of those times. There'll still be a Bounty Hunters Guild, but it's going to be a lot smaller. You want to be one of those that survive the shakeout? Because the alternative is death. He peered closer at Zuckus, seeing himself reflected and magnified in the other's eyes. Am I making myself clear? Zuckus gave a rapid nod. Perfectly clear. Good, said Kradosk. I like you. That's why I'm making you this kind of offer. In truth, it was a Trandoshan characteristic to despise all other life forms, and he wasn't making any exception in this case. You stick with me, and there's a good chance you'll make it. I'm not just talking about survival, but really getting somewhere in this organization. Loyalty to the right creatures, that is, has its rewards. What? What is it you want me to do? First off, keep your vocal apparatus muted concerning what we're talking about right now. The first part of loyalty is being able to keep a secret. Any bounty hunter who can't keep his mouth shut isn't long for this galaxy. At least, not in any organization that I am running. Another fast nod. I can keep quiet. I figured as much. Kradosk let his smile reappear. We're all scoundrels here, but some of us are better scoundrels than others. He leaned farther forward this time, close enough that the breath from his flared nostrils formed momentary clouds on Zuckus's eyes. Here's the deal. You've heard about the off dinid job. Of course. Everybody in the guild is talking about it. Including my son, Bosk, I take it? Zuckus nodded. He's the one I heard it from. I knew he'd jump on it. Kradosk got some satisfaction from that. His spawn was at least ambitious, if not overly smart. He likes the big jobs with the big payoffs. This dinid job is just the kind of thing to get him salivating. Did he say anything about putting together a team to go for it? Not to me. He will, said Kradosk. I'll see to that personally. My son may show some initial reluctance to having you on the team, but I'll make it worth his while to take you along. There's some equipment to which I can provide access. Some inside information sources. I'm sure he'd find valuable. That sort of thing. More than enough to make up for whatever share he and the others would have to cut you in on for being part of the operation. That's very kind of you. Suspicion was discernible behind the curved lenses of Zuckus's eyes. But why would you do something like that? There was hope for this creature yet. He wasn't a complete idiot. It's very simple, said Krados quietly. I do something for you. He tapped his claw against the top of the other's face mask. And you do something for me. With the last word, the point of Kradosk's claw tapped against his own chest. Now that's not too hard to understand, is it? Zuckus nodded slowly, as though the claw in front of his face had hypnotized him. What is it that you want me to do? Now that's simple as well. Kradosk rested both his hands on the bony arms of the campaign chair. 
You're going to go out with the team that my son Bosk is putting together to snag this particular piece of merchandise named Ofnardinid. The difference between you and Bosk, however, is that you'll be coming back. It took a few seconds, but illumination finally struck Zuckus. Oh. The nod was even slower this time. I see. I'm glad you do. Krardosk gestured toward the door. We'll talk some more later. When Zuckus had scurried out of the chamber, Krardosk allowed himself a few moments of self-satisfied musing. There was lots more to do, strings to pull, words to be whispered in the appropriate ears. But for now, he had to admit to himself that he actually did like this Zuckus creature. To a degree, thought Krardosk. Just smart enough to be useful, but not smart enough to realize how he was being used. At least, until it was too late. He might even feel some regret when it came time to eliminate Zuckus as well. But such, Krardosk knew, were the burdens of leadership. It had taken some doing, plus prying and digging with various tools improvised from stiff, sharp-pointed pieces of wire. But those were the sort of skills that Twi'lek males were born with. The result... After nearly a year of surreptitious work on the part of the Major Domo, was a tiny, undetectable listening hole up near the ceiling of the anteroom to Krardoska's private chamber. Better than any electronic snooping device, those could always be detected with a basic security scan sweep. The Major Domo, even as he was listening to the conversation between Krardosk and the young bounty hunter Zuckus, congratulated himself on his cleverness. One had to be clever to survive working for carnivores like these. Using a combination of toeholds between the wall's massive stones and an ornamental wall hanging depicting the guild's past glories, Ob Fortuna clambered down from his eavesdropping post. He had heard Krardosk dismissing Zuckus, their secretive discussion over for the time being. Past experience enabled the Major Domo to calculate precisely how long it would take for someone to turn from in front of the bench where the guild leader always sat and walk the few meters to the chamber door. It was just long enough for the Major Domo to get back down and brush the dust and cobweb fragments from himself, as though he had been standing there all along waiting like a good and faithful and non-conspiratorial servant. I trust your talk was pleasant. The Major Domo escorted Zuckus to the next door, leading out of the anteroom to the corridors of the Bounty Hunters Guild headquarters. And that you found inspiration in it. Zuckus seemed distracted. It took a moment for him to respond. Yes, yes. He gave a nod as he walked. Very inspiring. That's the word, all right. Idiot, thought the Major Domo. He had heard every syllable that had passed between this creature and Krardosk. Whether Krardosk was aware of it or not, there were no secrets around here. Not as far as I'm concerned. Excellent, the Major Domo smiled, showing all of his own sharp pointed teeth. He held open the anteroom door, using his other hand to keep his head tail from falling across his shoulder as he gave a precisely calculated bow. I trust we will have the pleasure of your company again. What? Standing in the corridor, Zuckus gazed at him as though puzzled by those simple words. Oh, yes, of course. I imagine you will. He turned and walked away, like one weighted by a new and unforeseen responsibility. The Major Domo watched him go. He was more familiar with the various shades of meaning attached to Krardosk's utterances. Nothing was ever as it seemed on the surface. The poor bounty hunter didn't have a clue as to what kind of lethal mess he was getting into. But Ob Fortuna did. He glanced behind him, across the length of the anteroom, to make sure that the door to Krardosk's chambers was still closed. Then he hurried down toward the opposite end of the corridor, 
to where the others who would be interested in this conversation would be waiting. With his hands tucked inside the folds of his long-skirted robes, he was already calculating the profits that would come from another piece of information brokering. And that ends chapter 14. Again, we're getting deep into the conspiracy of this. Uh, not having the action-packed uh, scenes that we had in the last chapters that we did uh, with the Sarlacc and the Sarlacc segment, the part of the tentacle that was still alive! Um, this is a little bit slower. Um, so just hanging out, having more conversations. We're sort of putting all the pieces into play, or into place, rather, uh, for this game of intergalactic chess that we're about to see happen. I am a little surprised at how stupid Bosk seems like he can be, or at least, like, like his dad certainly thinks he's kind of dumb. And if it's true that he really doesn't realise that other people are scheming against him and quite how deep he is in here, it, he does seem a bit dim. Um, and again, like, the way he's talking to Boba Fett, as if Boba Fett won't know about the job, but to be fair... It is possible that Bosk actually does know that Boba Fett knows, and it could all be one great big twisty turny um, backstab from everyone. It's like uh, like backstabbing a conga line. If you do it right, you all die. So, do you guys think that Bosk is that stupid? Do you think that's kind of fitting with the Bosk that we know from other pieces of media? Let me know. I I'm not as familiar with all the extended universe stuff we have of Bosk. And for the moment, as time is moving on, I will go on to chapter 15. Depending on how long this chapter is, I don't think we will be able to have three chapters this episode. I think we're just going to have the two. But let's enjoy them anyway. What are we waiting for? Bosk gnashed his fangs in impatient fury. We should have been on our way by now. Patience, counseled Boba Fett. In this case, it is not so much a virtue as a necessity. That is, if you want to pull off this job and live to tell about it. He watched the Trandoshan resume cursing and muttering under his breath, pacing back and forth in front of one of the landing docks farthest from the Bounty Hunters Guild complex. It struck Fett that he wouldn't have to do anything at all in order to assure Bosk's destruction. Eventually, the reptilian would explode from the rage bottled up inside him. Or at least, he thought, that much anger will cause a fatal mistake somewhere along the line. Boba Fett's own survival was predicated on both violence and the cold, emotionless precision of his strategies and actions. Without the former, all the planning and scheming in the galaxy would be impotent. That was something that the Empire, from Darth Vader's underlings all the way up to Palpatine himself, understood completely. What a creature like Bosk didn't comprehend was that violence, however necessary, was a bomb nestled against one's own heart in the absence of meticulous calculation. He'll find out, thought Fett, soon enough. The smaller bounty hunter, Zuckus, glanced nervously from Boba Fett over to Bosk, then back again. Maybe, he said, an advanced party should head toward the shell huts. Do some reconnaissance, so that when the rest of our team shows up there, we'll be ready to go right in. Don't be stupid, Boba Fett shook his head. The only thing that would accomplish would be to warn the shell huts of our intentions. It's going to be hard enough keeping any element of surprise without sending them a message like that. But the ships are ready to go. Bosk whirled about on the clawed heel of his foot. If we wait any longer, the other guild members will put together teams for taking on this dinner job. They'll beat us to it. Boba Fett didn't look up from the data readout in his hands. He continued checking the Slave One's armaments list. It would be no great tragedy if anyone did that. Since they would have no chance of success, our merchandise would still be safely in the hands of the Shell Huts, waiting for us. And it might actually facilitate our own plans, once we put them into motion. The Shell Huts would see the difference between us and some crude pack trying to blast their way into the stronghold. You keep telling us about these great plans you've made. Bosk aimed a venomous stare at Fett, 
When are you going to let us know exactly what they are? As I said before, unflinchingly, Boba Fett returned the other's hard gaze. You need to cultivate patience. Bosk turned away again, his grumbling even louder than before. The other team member was there with them in the landing dock. IG-88, a droid that had managed to become one of the Bounty Hunter Guild's more respected members. In fact, one of the few that Boba Fett would even consider to be a serious rival, brought his optical scanners around in Fett's direction. There is patience, said IG-88 in a harshly synthesized voice. And then there is hesitation. The letter comes from fear and indecision. We decided upon you as the leader of this team's operations because we assumed that such were not your qualities. Our disappointment would be great if we found out otherwise. If you think you can pull off this job without me, Fett lowered the data readout in his hands, then go ahead. IG-88 regarded him for a moment longer, then gave a single nod of his head. You remain our leader, but I warn you, don't exhaust what patience we do have. Mine's already gone. Bosk had obviously continued stewing. The look in his slitted eyes had gone from murderous to annihilating. One hand hovered dangerously close to the blaster slung at his hip. I've changed my mind. This whole team notion was a stupid idea. Um, Bosk? Zuckus raised his voice. It was your idea. If I started it, then I can put an end to it as well. His gaze slowly moved across the three other bounty hunters. You lot can do whatever you want, but I'm out of this. I'm going after Ofna Dinid myself. I'm afraid you don't have that option. Boba Fett tucked the readout inside one of his armor's storage pouches. His voice seemed even more level and emotionless compared with Bosk's boiling anger. You know too much about this operation for you to be on the outside of it. When you come in with me on a job, you stay until it's over. There's really only one way for you to quit. Yeah? Bosk sneered. What's that? IG-88 remained standing as before, his equally cold droid emotions, or the lack of them, observing the confrontation. Zuckus drew back, ready to duck behind the fuselage of one of the ships in the landing dock as Boba Fett dropped his hand to the curved grip of his own blaster. Go ahead, said Boba Fett, and try walking out on us, and you'll find out. The atmosphere tensed, as though filling with a subphotonic discharge from a battlecruiser's venting ports. In the taut silence, Boba Fett gave a silent command to the heavily armed figure standing in front of him. Go ahead, he thought. It'll save us all a lot of time. There's someone coming! Zuckus's voice broke through the adrenaline-frozen moment. He pointed to the distant high arch that formed the entrance to the landing dock. Beyond it, a streak of fiery light cut a crescent past the stars. Another ship! Bosk held his gaze tight on Boba Fett's for a moment longer, then glanced over his shoulder. The approaching light had grown brighter, its docking jets flaring into a sudden corona. He looked back at Fett. Is this who we've been waiting for? It could be. Boba Fett didn't take his hand from the grip of his blaster. Lucky for you. That's right, said Boba Fett. If I had had to kill you, I would have needed to find another person for the team. His hand moved away from the smallest of his weapons. I find personnel changes to be aggravating. Zuckus peered past them at the approaching ship. I don't recognize this one. It was close enough that its outlines could be seen. A featureless ovoid, barely larger than a TIE fighter, trailing a metallic sen, a stiffly interlinked net behind its flaring engines. 
How did it get clearance? I arranged for that. Boba Fett stepped past Zuckus and the others, walking toward the pad that the approaching craft had locked upon. But it wouldn't have made any difference if I had not. What do you mean? Zuckus scurried after Fett. Believe me, this Barv goes where he wants to. The ovoid could be seen more clearly now as it slid into the landing dock, thrust engines shut down and repulses on. Its rounded surfaces were pitted and scored with the impact marks of high-intensity armaments, including one large scorch mark where the metal had actually melted and fused back together. As it hovered above the pad, its trailing mesh shifted and drew forward, one part curling above like a scorpion's tail, the other forming a reticulated cradle beneath, onto which the craft slowly sank and was still. Look at this thing! Fascinated, Zuckus had walked right up to the ovoid, his boots stepping onto the mesh. He laid a gloved hand on the battered and corrosion-marked surface. It looks like it's been in every battle since the Clone Wars! Watch out, said Boba Fett, but the warning was already too late. A microscopic hairline fissure around the top of the ovoid widened with a hiss of inrushing air. An elliptical section separated from the rest, tilting upward on a previously hidden internal hinges. For a moment, nothing further showed from inside the craft. As though released by a high-compression spring, the barrel of a close-range laser cannon rose up, with its power sources and recoil housing mounted directly behind. The gleaming surfaces of black metal shone like the coils of an aroused serpent, intricate and deadly. A faint, shrill, electronic whir sounded as the massive weapon's sight-ranging devices locked on to Zuckus, swinging the point of the muzzle down within a meter of the bounty hunter's chest. Another series of sharp, concussive noises sounded within the machinery as the indicator light's glow shifted from yellow to a hot red, charged and ready to fire. That was followed by silence. Zuckus froze where he stood, as though hypnotized by the black hole almost within touching distance of his hand, and its lethal potential even closer than that. There would be only a haze of disconnected atoms floating above the scorched remains of his boots after one shot from this weapon. Back up, said Boba Fett quietly. Do it slow, and you probably won't get hurt. Hurt? Beside him, Bosk was gazing in wide-eyed fascination at the laser cannon's darkly gleaming barrel. He's going to be vaporized! Zuckus was unable to take his own gaze away from the death-bestowing machinery locked upon him, but he did manage to take one cautious step backward, then another. All the while, the weapon's tracking systems followed his every move, shifting angle slightly to remain targeted. A few more steps, and Zuckus was back with the other bounty hunters. Stay here, Boba Fett told him. Don't worry. The stink of panic sweat seeped out of Zuckus's gear. I'm not going anywhere. Boba Fett had already stepped past him, leaving Bosk and IG-88 behind him as well. He strode without visible apprehension across the landing dock toward the ovoid resting above its glittering mesh. The laser cannon swung and locked onto him as he approached. It's been a long time. He stopped and spoke to the weapon itself, as though its charge-primed muzzle were a face masked like his, with the tracking systems as its all-seeing eyes. A very long time. The red indicator lights along the weapon's housing cooled from red through a dull orange down to a steady state yellow. The optics and sensors of the tracking systems defocused slightly, as though the hand and mind behind the trigger had relaxed to a state of mere vigilance, rather than instantaneous aggression. Slowly, the laser cannon rose, as though being lifted on some mechanism inside the ovoid-shaped craft. A cloud of hissing steam surrounded it, obscuring for a moment the outlines of the weapon, as though it were an outcropping of black rock on a mountain peak 
wreathed in a sudden, violent storm. The cannon parted the stream as a massive humanoid torso appeared below, its wide shoulders bearing the weapon's crushing weight. From the underside of the barrel, a quarter circle of gear-toothed metal curved down into an anchoring plate set in the creature's chest, with interlocking motors to adjust the muzzle's terminal elevation. Heavy cables, some glistening black, others made of silvery steel, looped beneath the arms and around the muscle-sheathed chest and ribs, connecting the counterbalancing cylinders of power sources flanking the spine. The latter were revealed when the individual climbed out of the ovoid, black-gloved hands and thick-soled boots weighing upon the mesh's strands. From the intricate joints of the weapon's mounting, more steam lashed out, gathered and dissipated in trailing wisps, indicating the presence of an old-style liquid-based cooling system, primitive technology dating from the earliest days of the Republic. The laser cannon swung 180 degrees around on its mounting, as though the tracking system optics were actually the eyes in a head made of pure destructive capacity. A tail section, like a primitive saurian's, but made of segmented black metal and mounted by articulated bolts to the creature's hips, was the last thing to be dragged out of the craft. With its top section hinged back and its pilot standing before it, the resemblance to a giant egg was complete, as though it was just now cracked open to disgorge a new combination of living matter and lethal machinery. Behind the stranger, the tail curled across the edge of the stiffened mesh. With one hand, the creature unclipped a small keyboard device from the band of metal running from the hip bolts and across his abdomen. His other hand punched in a rapid sequence of ideograms, then thumbed a larger button in the device's corner. Long time. The device's speaker crackled as the stranger held it up in front of himself. Underneath the synthesized words, the hissing of the steam from the laser cannon's housing could still be heard. You do not seem to age, Boba Fett. Should I? The statement amused him. Time enough for that when I'm dead. He could hear the other bounty hunters behind him. Bosk's voice was louder than the rest. I don't like the look of this. The stranger was instantly transformed. Boba Fett knew that something had triggered a reaction sequence. On the housing of the laser cannon, the indicators flared red again. The tracking systems narrowed their focus, sighting in on a point behind Fett. Steam jetted farther from the housing's apertures as the segmented metal tail stiffened, bracing the stranger into a tripod rigid enough to take the force of the high-powered weapon's recoil. Boba Fett glanced over his shoulder and saw that Bosk had instinctively dropped his hand to the butt of his blaster slung at his hip. The Trandoshan always did that when something aroused his suspicions. Not a good idea said Fett. With a nod of his helmet, he indicated Bosk's hand, frozen in place by the laser cannon snapping into firing mode. Darren tends to kill first and not bother investigating afterward. Bosk took his hand away from the blaster. Good. Boba Fett looked towards Zuckus and IG-88 as well. Now our team is all here. Darren and I go back a long way. Across the controls of the Slave One, Boba Fett's hands moved swiftly, setting the coordinates for dropping back out of hyperspace. Longer than you can imagine. How come I've never heard of him? The ship's cockpit area was small enough that Zuckers had to remain standing in the hatchway behind Fett just to exchange a few words with him. He seems very impressive. Zuckers had had the choice of travelling with Bosk and IG-88 in the Hound's Tooth, but the Trandoshan's worsening temper had pushed him into the Slave One instead. Let the droid deal with him, Zuckers had decided. Droids don't take all that snarling and muttering personally. But heading toward the Shell Hut's home base, a ring-shaped artificial planetoid called Circumtor, aboard the Slave One had proved even more unnerving. The stranger named Daharan, 
or friend or mercenary companion or whatever he might have been at one time to Boba Fett, had found the most secure corner of the ship's below decks holding area and had sat down on the gridded flooring with his back to the angle of the bulkheads. Daharan had wrapped his flex-shielded arms around his knees, partially resting the weight of his laser cannon mounted on his shoulders on them. The weapon's gleaming barrel thrust slightly forward. When Zuckus had entered the area, moving as stealthily as possible, he'd suddenly heard a whisper of vented steam. The other's tracking systems had registered his presence, swinging the laser cannon in a horizontal arc toward him. Luckily, the firing indicators on the cannon's housing had remained in their yellow standby mode. It had taken a few moments for Zuckus to realise that this intimidating and unfamiliar entity was only partially conscious at that moment. The square, heavily armoured box mounted beneath the laser cannon's curved forward support, resembling a thick breastplate with rows of input sockets and flickering LEDs, was the repository of all Daharan's cerebral functions, surgically encased and transferred there from the emptied skull, discarded like an empty combat rations container when the massive weapon's base had been drilled into the collarbones and vertebral column what Boba Fett had described of the operation had been enough to set Zuckus's spine crawling. It was one thing to augment oneself with weapons and detection systems. Zuckus frankly envied Fett's impressive array of sensor and destructive devices. The man was a walking armory. But to go beyond that, to have whole major sections of one's anatomy cut away and replaced with durasteel and attack-level charge batteries to actually turn oneself into a weapon rather than just a bearer of weapons. A sick feeling had moved inside Zuckus's gut as he'd spied upon the sleeping Daharan. That's where it ends up, he thought gloomily. If you go all the way... The segmented metal tail, the third leg of the laser cannon's tripod support, curled around Daharan like a defensive barrier, separating him from contact with the universe of living things. Zuckus had taken a cautious step closer in the Slave One's hold. He'd known that Daharan wasn't so much asleep as just partially shut down, conserving energy for the ever-alert weapon above his torso, its glowing lights a simple constellation in the darkness. A residual circuit was triggered by Zuckus's approach, one of the black-gloved hands turned the illuminated screen of the keyboard voice box outward. Do not disturb me, read the screen. Its audio function switched off. Leave me be. Like a sleeping dragon in a cave, the fiery destruction of its breath only smouldering. The silent warning had been enough. Zuckus had been only too happy to retreat to the ladder leading back to the Slave One's cockpit. The dark, solemnant, yet threatening form of the creature who had turned himself into a weapon aroused mingled dread and nausea inside Zuckus. Once before he decided to become a bounty hunter himself, he caught a fleeting glimpse of Darth Vader, the Dark Lord of the Sith, commanding a punitive sweep of Imperial stormtroopers across the capital city of a world that had been slow to pay obeisance to the distant Emperor Palpatine. The thought had struck him then, as it did again now, that there were some paths one could follow, where even if one wound up powerful beyond one's dreams, one also became somehow diminished, as though the essence hidden inside the armour were progressively stripped away and replaced with unfeeling metal and circuitry. That was all too deep to think about, especially now when he had allied himself with creatures like Boba Fett and Daharan. Maybe later, Zuckus had mused as he climbed the ladder to the cockpit, if there was a later. I don't get that voice box device he carries around. Zuckus nodded toward the ladder in the hall below. Seems kind of awkward. I would have thought something that left his hands free would be more useful for communicating. Daharan doesn't have a lot of need for communicating. Boba Fett's voice sounded dryly amused. And before, when there were others like him, they coordinated their actions with their own internal comm network. 
There were others, like him, that seemed a dismaying prospect to Zuckus. What happened to them? Fett made no reply. Zuckus tried another question. What was he like before? He didn't even feel like saying the other's name aloud. Before he became what he is now. That's none of your business. Boba Fett didn't take his eyes away from Slave One's controls. He's been as he is for a long time. If you never knew of Daharan before, it's because he minds his own business. In regions of the galaxy where such as you never travel. Fett glanced over his shoulder at Zuckus. For which you should be grateful. The discussion of the final team member was concluded. Zuckus knew better than to ask any more prying questions. I'll be glad when this job is over, he thought ruefully. Things had been getting increasingly sticky back at the Bounty Hunters Guild, with its rapidly thickening air of conspiracy and stealth. The various backstabbing alliances forming and dissolving and re-coalescing with new partners and enemies on a daily, even hourly basis. Going on this off nard job, dangerous as the Shell Hut's defences were reputed to be, seemed like a piece of baked confectionery by comparison. But even here, in the starless world of hyperspace, Zuckus knew he was still in the uncomfortable midst of those dangerous spider webs. All it would take would be for Bosk or Boba Fett to find out that he was working for Kradosk's agenda, and he'd be pitched out into the vacuum from either the Slave One or the Hound's waste chute. Boots first. Agreeing to Kradosk's schemes was beginning to look like less of a good deal now that Zuckus was out here, with nothing to count on but his own smarts and urge to survive. Stop fidgeting. Boba Fett spoke without looking around at Zuckus. Brace yourself. We're about to drop into sublight space. Zuckus was already familiar with the Slave One's abrupt navigational transitions. Fett's working vessel was stripped of any deceleration buffers that might have impaired its speed or fighting abilities. The ship consequently slammed from one transit mode to another with a gut-wrenching impact. Zuckus grabbed either side of the hatchway and averted his lidless eyes so he wouldn't have to see the stars blur sickeningly into focus before the cockpit's main viewport. There's Bosk. Opening his eyes, Zucker saw the hound's tooth floating before them, engines shut off. A signal light flashed, and Boba Fett reached over and pressed the comm button. Fett here. Have you made contact with the Circumtor Landing Authorities? Positive on that. IG-88's flat, expressionless voice sounded from the cockpit speaker. Approach and landing permission has not, I repeat not, been granted. I didn't expect it would be, said Boba Fett dryly. When people like us show up, hardly anyone puts out a welcome mat. At the conclusion of our last exchange, the Shell Huts indicated they would be sending out a negotiator. What level? Bosk's voice broke into the discussion. The fat slug said it would be an Alpha Point Zero. What's that mean? Boba Fett kept his thumb on the comm button. That's the Shell Hut's top authority level. They don't go any higher than that. So it means two things. One, we don't have to bother with any small fry underlings. And two, they're taking our arrival very seriously. When this negotiator gets out here, what's our plan? Bosk sounded hungry for action, as though the journey out from the Bounty Hunters Guild had been an eternity of chafing in action. Kill him? Typical, thought Zuckus, slowly shaking his head. He'd had enough experience with Bosk to know that that was always his plan A, and there usually wasn't a plan B. Fett glanced over his shoulder at Zuckus. Don't worry. He turned and pressed the comm button again. We can be a little more subtle than that. You and RG-88 should transfer over here to the Slave One before the Shell Hut's negotiator arrives. But remember, I do the talking. Bosk's ship, the heavily armed Hound's Tooth, 
was left in auto standby, its alarm system set to refuse entry to anyone other than its returning master. Zuckus was aware of the level of Bosk's paranoia, and the number of lethal booby traps he had installed throughout the Hound, all to prevent anyone from invading his base of operations. That was the main reason Zuckus had gone instead with Boba Fett. His nerves had still been frayed from the last time he had been aboard the Hound's Tooth, when he constantly had to be on guard against setting off any of the security devices. Better to let the bounty hunter droid IG-88 take the risk, even if it meant losing track of Bosk, the main reason Zuckus was on the team for this job, for the duration of the journey. He went down into the Slave One's holding area to open the transfer hatch between the two ships. The hunched shape of the partially shut down Daharan filled one corner of the area. He could feel the laser cannon standby optics registering his presence, lifting the weapon's barrel slightly and turning it in his direction. As he stepped from the bottom rung of the ladder, from the small viewport beside the hatch, Zuckus could see the hound's tooth being maneuvered into docking position. When it had connected with the Slave One, Zuckus hit the hatch release controls. A sharp hiss sounded as the two ships equalized their internal atmospheric pressures. The hatched iris open and Bosk and IG-88 stepped aboard. Bosk pressed a button on the remote cockpit control at his wrist and the Hound disengaged and drew into a parallel orbit above the surface of Sorkumtor. Where's Fett? Boss scanned the Slave One's holding area. Though it was the largest open space aboard the ship, it was already cramped with the three bounty hunters in it. Boba Fett's ship was built for speed and destruction, not comfort. Zuckus pointed to the ladder leading to the cockpit. He's still up there. I think he's getting ready for the arrival of the Shell Hut negotiator. His guess was proved correct when Boba Fett's voice crackled from a speaker mounted on the bulkhead. We'll need to make room, said Fett over the ship's internal comm system. I've just been informed that the negotiator is one of the shell huts. They didn't send one of their pet intermediaries. If we're going to get one of those tanks aboard here, we'll need all the space we can get. I don't see how. Zuckus turned looking around the Slave One's holding area. The only room down here is in the cages. So? Boba Fett's voice spoke again. What's the problem? Bosk glared at the cages where Boba Fett kept his captured pieces of merchandise, en route to collecting the bounty on them. I'm not going in there, he growled. You're the biggest one here, Zuckus pointed out helpfully. Except, of course, uh, he pointed to Daharan's massive bulk, the laser cannon's barrel protruding slightly above the drawn-up knees and encircled metal tail. For him? The three bounty hunters looked over at Daharan. I don't know, said Bosk. Even he seemed intimidated by the presence of a fully charged laser cannon in their midst. Maybe it's not a good idea to wake him up. Too late. One of Daharan's hands tapped out another message on the silenced voice box and turned its glowing screen toward them. I hear everything you say. Zuckus and the other two bounty hunters stepped back, spines against the bulkhead, as the roused Daharan slowly stood up, the segmented metal tail drawing around behind him. The housing of the laser cannon mounted onto Daharan's chest and shoulders reached above even Bosk's head. The massive weapon's tracking system regarded the bounty hunters in silence for a moment. Watch out! Zuckus's cry was involuntary, triggered by the sight of the indicator lights on the laser cannon suddenly surging to red. He dived to the floor as Bosk and IG-88 scattered to either side of the cramped-looking area. On the grilled floor, with his arms pulled over his head, Zuckus heard the quick, sharp sizzle of a laser bolt, then another. Their glare lit up the space, stinging his eyes. In the quiet that followed, he could smell ozone and scorched metal. Lifting his head, Zuckus saw the lights on the other side of the animate laser cannon dwindling back down to yellow and safety. 
Flanking the holding area, Bosk and IG-88 looked first toward Daharan, then toward the target of his ramped-down laser bolts. The impact had been precisely calculated and aimed, shattering the hinges of the main merchandise cage. Fragments of molten durasteel scattered across the floor, glowed a dull red. Wisps of acrid smoke rose from the edge of the cage floor as it fell with a resounding clang. There, spoke Jaharan's voice box aloud. Now you should have no objections. Your point is valid. IG-88's circuitry had recovered completely from the sudden burst of laser fire. The droid stepped over the bars of the fallen door and into what was left of the cage, then turned around. Bosk regarded Daharan for a moment longer, his slitted eyes looking up at the cooling laser cannon with something like envy, then followed the other bounty hunter into the area's adjoining space, now incapable of being shut and locked. That'll take some fixing, thought Zuckus. Considering the proprietary attitude that Boba Fett naturally took toward the Slave One and its fittings, he was more than relieved that Daharan had blown the holding cage's hinges and not him. At that moment, Boba Fett appeared on the ladder coming down from the cockpit. The bounty hunters watched as Fett's visored gaze turned toward the cage in which he transported his merchandise, then down to the barred door lying in front of it. That's coming out of your share. Fett told Daharan. The black-gloved hand moved across the voice box's keyboard. No, it's not. For a moment longer, they stood facing each other, one masked behind the visored helmet, the other faceless, except for the muzzle of the laser cannon, before Boba Fett finally gave a slow nod. We'll talk. There's a ship approaching, Zuckus pointed to the viewport. It must be the Shell Hut's negotiator. In the viewport, a spherical craft moved closer to the Slave One, a simple off-planet shuttle. It displayed the tortoise insignia of the Shell Hut's and a diplomatic emblazon showing its unarmed status. The shuttle's forward hatch had already deployed its docking arms, ready to hook up with the Slave One's transfer hatch. A few moments later, as Zuckus manned the hatch's controls, a broad face with a slit gash of a mouth appeared floating before the bounty hunters. The elongated, tapering cylinder of the Shell Hut negotiator moved with ponderous grace into the holding area, its underside repulsor beams pushing invisibly against the floor grids. As the end of the tank-like casing made it through the transfer hatch, Zuckus hit the button and irised the hatch close again. Ah, Boba Fett! The casing, studded with rivets and various maintenance ports, swung about in the holding area, past the other bounty hunters and toward the figure standing near the metal ladder. A leering smile formed on the shell hut's face. Tiny, mechanical hands dangled beneath a gleaming chromium collar, sealed tight around the wattled grey flesh of its neck. The claws, delicate as a scuttling sea crabs, clicked happily against each other. How pleasant to see you again. Fett's response was dry and emotionless. My feelings, Gita, are the same as the last time we met. Bosk spoke from the holding cage. You know this creature? We've had business dealings. Fett didn't look back at the Trandoshan. A couple times before. And very profitable they were too. The cylinder with the shell hut inside bobbed slightly as it turned toward Bosk. At least for some people. The smile on Gita's face soured. I hope he said to Boba Fett, that you're not expecting the same degree of trust that you found previously on Circumtor. The little crab-like hands snapped their metal claws together, hard enough to produce sparks. After that last affair of yours, Fett, you're not going to be greeted with open arms. I don't need to be. Boba Fett stood face to face with the shell hut. 
You're a business creature, Gita, and so am I. Warm sentiments have nothing to do with it. If you're ready to do business, then we have something to talk about. If you're not ready, then we don't. The same old Boba Fett. The shell hut's head, its jowly neck bound by the floating cylinder's colander, managed an appreciative nod. It's good to know that some things in this universe never change. Just what business is it you've come to Circumtor to discuss? I think you've got a pretty good idea of that. Gita's expression turned sly, the lids over his large eyes drawing halfway down. It wouldn't be something to do with a certain Ofnardi need, would it? Stop wasting time! Bosk's angry shout broke in. You know damn well that's what we're here for! An amused glance from the corner of one eye, then Gita looked back at Fett. Your associate has a charming directness about him. Fett nodded. Among other virtues... The others must be well concealed, said Gita dryly. One of the metal hands reached up to scratch between the wattles at the side of his neck. You realize, of course, that the party under discussion, this Dinid person, is a guest on Circumtor. You know how all huts are about hospitality. The happiness of a guest is a sacred obligation with our species. Spare me, thought Zuckus, watching the exchange between Boba Fett and the Shell Hut. Throughout the galaxy, the treachery and outright malice that Hut showed toward any who found themselves in one of their windowless palaces was proverbial. Zuckus had heard things about how the infamous Jabba, the preeminent Hutti's crime lord, went through so-called guests and the more disposable type of servants that made his flesh crawl. That was the difference, Zuckus supposed, between Boba Fett and a creature like this Gita. Fett didn't go out of his way to hurt or even kill anyone. If it happened, it happened whereas huts in general took an active delight in other creatures' suffering. There are some, said Boba Fett, who would take an interest in Dinid's happiness equal to your own. Ah, yes. The massive head at the forward end of the repulsor-born cylinder nodded. Dinid's former employers. I take it that you're here on their behalf. I'm here on no one's behalf but my own. But of course. Gita's smile expanded enough to reveal his wet, flickering tongue. I really expected nothing else. Altruism is in short supply among the practitioners of your trade. I imagine it's the same for your friends here. One of the little crab-like hands raised and gestured at the others in the Slave One's holding area. Rather an intimidating crew, don't you think, Fett? It makes the heart inside my casing tremble just to look at them. Gita peered more closely at Bosk. Let's see. You're Krardosk's son, aren't you? Bosk's eyes were two razor slits. His voice a low snarl. What's that matter to you? You really are his son. Gita widened his eyes in mock fright. Give the old reptile my best regards the next time you see him, which shouldn't be too long from now. The shell hut rotated himself back toward Boba Fett. Because if you think I'm going to let an obviously vicious bunch like this come sailing down to Circumtor, then you've got a few circuits blown inside that helmet of yours, Fett. The remark produced no reaction in its target. We can hardly discuss the matter out here, said Boba Fett. I make it a rule to talk business only when the merchandise is on the table, so to speak. I have to warn you. The claws of the little mechanical hands clicked against each other again. This is very expensive merchandise we're talking about. That makes it all the more profitable, then. 
Fett indicated the other bounty hunters. And that's why we've come here. I can believe that well enough. Gita used one of the claws to scratch the almost boneless flesh of his chin. I just don't know if you're really changed in your ways. My dear Fett, regarding just how you acquire your profitable merchandise, I had heard, naturally, about your having joined the Bounty Hunters Guild, and I must admit that all my clan on Circumtor were surprised by the news. Getting old and tired, are we, Fett? Not tired? Boba Fett gave a slow shake of his head. Just smart. Smart for you, no doubt. The Shell Hut broadcast his sly, insinuating smile around the others. I wonder, though, just what your newfound friends here get out of the deal. Zuckus found himself gazing straight into the Shell Hut's eyes as the floating cylinder turned his way. The same sensation came over him as when he had felt the tracking systems of Dahan's laser cannon locking onto him, calculating the precise angle and force necessary for his destruction. The pupils of Gita's eyes were like narrow windows into a realm of avarice, the slow and certain calculus of insatiable appetites. Getting blown away, literally into disconnected atoms, by a laser bolt, would be mercifully quick by comparison. Another feeling, even more disquieting, moved inside Zuckus, that the dark pupils regarding him with such amused contempt were not windows, but mirrors into his own heart. Little creature. He could hear Gita speaking inside his head. I am what you would like to be. All mouth and gut and hunger. In this cold galaxy, the commandment of eat or be eaten prevailed, from the throne of the Emperor Palpatine all the way down to the smallest carnivore, a Tatooinean womp rat scuttling across an empty desert. His heart dwindled within himself from that moment of recognition in the Shell Hut's eyes. There had been others who had lived and fought, their struggles guided by a different code. There had been a time when even he had listened to the tales of the Jedi Knights defending the Old Republic. But those are just stories now, Zuckus told himself. Those days, and the brave creatures that had lived in them, were never coming back. And without them, the rebels fighting against the Empire were poor, pathetic fools doomed to failure. Their bones would be picked clean and discarded on the battlefield of worlds without names. The hungry ones with their greed and lust for dominion, would always win. Bleak, wordless meditation ended as the Shell Hut's knowing, judging smile moved away from him. Pull yourself together, Zuckus told himself. He had made his pact with the universe he found himself in. He was a bounty hunter now, and had been so long enough to be travelling in league with some of the toughest ones in the galaxy. If he showed any sign of weakness at this point, he knew he wouldn't have to worry about Emperor Palpatine or any of the Shell Huts. His own colleagues would tear him apart. A carnivore like Bosk would very likely consume him, in the exact and literal sense of the word. That thought made Zuckus feel at least a little better about having become part of old Kradosk's intricate scheming. Better you than me, he thought glancing over at Bosk. Don't worry about us. That was Bosk's voice, giving a snaring reply to Gita. We can take care of ourselves. I'm sure you can. The Shell Hut didn't stop smiling. After all, you're learning from the Master, aren't you? Boba Fett has always done very well for himself. I would be doing even better, said Fett, if we could limit our discussion to that which we came here for, specifically that merchandise known as Ofna Dinid. But that merchandise isn't on the table right now, is it? Gita's large eyes emitted a spark of danger. And it's not going to be. Not out here at least. 
You want to discuss the fate of our guests, you will indeed have to come down to Circumtor to do it. Just as you wish. I'm only here to explain how things are in that regard. I'm giving you the conditions, not cutting the deal. Why not? Zucker spoke up. I don't get it. The other members of your clan wouldn't have sent you out here if you didn't have some kind of authority to speak for them. If they just wanted to send us a message, they could have calmed it out here or sent some flunky of a different species, like a Twi'lek or something. So why mess around? If you're willing to talk about Dinid at all, why not do it here? The smile on the broad, jowly face turned into a sneer. Your colleague Boba Fett wouldn't ask such a stupid question. A question which has an equally simple answer. We are all aboard the Slave One right now, aren't we? The Slave One is Boba Fett's ship. He controls it. So as long as we're here, he controls the discussion as well. There have been times when discussions with Boba Fett have gotten a little ugly. Things start out nice and friendly, and then they just change somehow. Gita feigned mulling over that statement. Probably because the parties involved couldn't come to an agreement about the value and price of the merchandise being discussed. He glanced over at Fett. You always like to get things as cheaply as possible, don't you? Boba Fett made no reply. Cheaply, continued Gita, as far as credits are concerned. When it comes to violence... Well, that's another story, isn't it? The floating cylinder turned, bringing the shell hut's face back towards Zuckus. That's when your colleague has rather a free hand, especially when other creatures' skins are involved. And the blood, that can also get a little thick to wade through when Boba Fett's around. Another shift in angle brought Geeta's face toward the bounty hunters in general. So if you think I'm going to remain here, in the heart of Fett's traveling circus of destruction, surrounded by his friends, or if not his friends, then creatures with whom he's come to a certain business arrangement, and talk about the merchandise in question, let alone actually bring that merchandise here. Gita's jowls wobbled against the cylinder's gleaming collar as he shook his head. Then it's not just Boba Fett who's gone a little insane. You're all not in sync with reality if you think that's going to happen. A low growl came from the doorless holding cage. You've said your piece. Bosk folded his arms against his chest. Gita looked over at the Trandoshan. Yes, I have. And now, you're going to be on your way? As charming as your company is, I see no reason for wasting any more of your time or mine. What makes you think we're going to let you leave? A weary sigh escaped from the shell hut as he rolled his eyes toward the top of the holding area. I really expected better from any companions of yours, Fett. Do you want to tell him, or should I? He leaves when he wants to, said Boba Fett. He turned the hard gaze of his visored helmet toward the holding cage. First of all, the merchandise we came here for is still down on Circumtor. Anything unpleasant we do to the negotiator that the Shell Hut sent out will just make it harder to accomplish anything later, when we actually go on planet. Bosk laid his hand on the grip of his blaster. Maybe we should just worry about that when we get down there. I don't see any big difference between taking care of one canned hut and a whole world full of them. There's more inside that can than one hut. I've dealt with their negotiators before. They never send out one that isn't packed with high thermal explosives. You see... One of the mechanical hands beneath Gita's floating cylinder gestured theatrically toward Boba Fett. 
That's why he's at the top of the bounty hunter profession. It's why he lasted so long, while others have met tragically untimely deaths. Because he's learned that other creatures can be just as clever and violent if need be. The thin metal arm telescoped outward so that the crab-like hand could reach up to an access hatch at the midpoint of the cylinder's tapered length. One claw pried open the hatch, revealing a ticking mechanism wired into several flat bricks of a dull grey substance. From where he stood, Zuckus could see the emblem and coding symbols of one of the Imperial Navy's main armament dumps. The explosive charges had obviously been stolen or smuggled out by some enterprising accomplice, but they were still more than lethal. Just looking at that much destructive force made Zuckus's breath catch in the tubes dangling from his mask. And with that reveal of there being these dangerous explosives and the hut now in a bit of hot water with Zuckus, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it on that slight cliffhanger. We have gone over our usual time for this, and I want to make sure that we get a video out for you on Wednesday when the new episode of The Book of Boba comes out. So... Guys, that's going to be it for me. I've really enjoyed this chapter, and I want to hear anything you have to say about it in the comments. I find it really cool. I love Daharan. I think that's a great sci-fi concept. The bounty hunter whose entire head has been replaced with a gun, and how they've had to move his brain matter into, like, a box somewhere else on his um, body so that he can still, like, exist and think and stuff. Um, and the fact that he's got this tail, it reminds me very much of uh, the Titanite demons from um, Dark Souls. Uh, this guy is cool, he sounds like an action figure, a little bit over the top, I've never seen anything like that in Star Wars before, um, although I suppose it's like an extreme version of the modders from the Book of Boba TV show. Would you guys love to see a guy in the Book of Boba who's just a cannon on a pair of shoulders? I think I would. Um, let me know if you would, and in the meantime, you could, if you like this video and you like what you hear, subscribe to our channel. If you hit the bell icon, you'll actually get notifications when new videos go up. And if you feel like it, like the video. And uh, just share it with someone who you think might like it as well. Someone else who's a big Star Wars fan and would love to hear a free audiobook. But until then, I will see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.